It seems clear that the gospel preached by Jesus and the apostles has somehow been exchanged for one that allows ancient sins to flourish in even the church leadership, sins which the apostolic gospel plainly condemned. It is not merely the case that a few minor planks have been added or subtracted from the platform of the original gospel. Rather, there is reason to believe that the whole nature of the message commonly embraced among Christians is other than that which was expounded and assumed by Jesus and the apostles. A century ago, Philip Morrow, in his book The Gospel of the Kingdom, opined, It has long been my conviction that the present-day weakness of God's people, their internal disorders and divisions, and the utter failure of their collective testimony to the world, are mainly due to the fact that they are not instructed and established in the great truth declared in the opening verses of Colossians, namely, that when God received those who believed the word of the truth of the gospel, verse 5, he delivered them from the power of darkness, a kingdom, and translated them into the kingdom of his dear Son, verse 13. Now, it is most needful for us to observe that the subject of the kingdom of God is of the very essence of the gospel of Christ, and is of immediate and vital importance to all mankind. If the reader will continue with me through the following chapters, it will be glaringly obvious that the gospel preached by Jesus and by the apostles, and which Jesus said must be preached in all the world before the end comes, is the good news concerning something called the kingdom of God. While every Christian is familiar with this expression, only a tiny minority of those in our churches could give a definition of the kingdom that even approximates the biblical assumptions concerning its nature or its ramifications. Every Christian in the first century attached a specific meaning to this phrase, the kingdom of God, and knew what its ramifications were. It is my contention that this original understanding of the gospel of the kingdom was that which inspired such enthusiasm, righteous living, steadfastness, peace, and joy in the earliest Christians. As Paul wrote to the Romans, The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. In my experience, when modern Christians learn the reality of this gospel of the kingdom for the first time, it imbues them with vision, purpose, and zeal for Christ that they previously had struggled to maintain under the influence of the modern, denatured gospel. This has been my own experience, and conforms to that to which I have heard very many others testify. C. Peter Wagner, a prominent leader in the church growth movement, confessed, I cannot help wondering out loud why I haven't heard more about the kingdom of God in the thirty years I have been a Christian. I certainly read about it enough in the Bible, but I honestly cannot remember any pastor whose ministry I have been under actually preaching a sermon on the kingdom of God. As I rummaged through my own sermon barrel, I now realize that I myself have never preached a sermon on it. Where has the kingdom been? Unquote. Pastor and author John MacArthur in his book Slave, The Hidden Truth About Your Identity in Christ, echoes essentially the same point. After 50 years of translating, studying, teaching, preaching, and writing through the New Testament, I thought I had its truths pretty well identified and understood, especially in the realm of the New Testament theology of the gospel. But through all of those efforts, a profound and comprehensive perspective, one that dominates the New Testament and is crucial to the gospel, escaped me and almost everyone else." Unquote. Another pastor in his recent book, Seek First, How the Kingdom of God Changes Everything, similarly laments, How could I have spent a lifetime hearing about Jesus, yet never studied or paid attention to the one thing Jesus talked about most? The kingdom had no place in my theology, my church life, or my perception of what it meant to be a Christian." Unquote. I believe that this testimony can be echoed by millions of modern Christians, including evangelical preachers worldwide. A hundred years ago, the same complaint was raised, and the same diagnosis was made by Philip Morrow when he wrote, But where, it will be asked, are the heroes of faith in our day? My answer is that the material is here even as it was in the days of the apostles, and that what is lacking is that gospel which was preached by them, the gospel of the kingdom." Unquote. It is the kingdom of God that deserves the highest priority in our conception and communication of the gospel, and it is the apprehension of this truth that promises to fill the individual believer with transcendent purpose in life and to revive the church in our day.